Yeah, welcome everyone for High Performance Computing Practical Lecture 10.1 today. It is about deep learning driven by big data, and it is an invited lecture by postdoc Gabriele Cavallaro, who is working at the Ulich Supercomputing Center in Germany, but graduated here from the University of Iceland with a PhD and is an interesting candidate also if you have questions about the academic life, perhaps to really um, talk with him how it is here to do a PhD in Iceland. Um, before we go into the material of deep learning, let us review it a little bit what basics we had from the last time, essentially thinking about machine learning. So this was about lecture 10, where we talked about machine learning fundamentals. And this is essentially saying that all the algorithms and many of the approaches you can really put in th to three different categories, so to speak, right? It's about classification. That means you would have already two established classes and you would have a new data item and it would be somehow automatically classified to either this or that, the red or the green um, class really in terms of data. So this is what we talked about is predicting a class or data. However, sometimes um, you don't have this class labels as we discussed. So you would have a so-called unsupervised learning setup in clustering where you have a couple of data items and they are not really building a class, but you can form, so to speak, a class or you can form a cluster by saying that you have different similarity measures. And if you here, for instance, think in the example here, um, which is about the blue ones, um, really thinking about the Euclidean distance, you clearly see they're kind of two clusters so that their the difference in space is much smaller. And then there are a couple of algorithms focusing more on regression tasks, which means really finding a trend in the data. So the more, let's say, advertising money you give in to some certain campaign, how much of, you know, new sales of products you can expect. So this is something which, of course, leaves a little bit machine learning in a way, much more trivial models, which are more or less overlaps into statistics. But really, today we have interesting ideas how to do classification also with more advanced algorithms. But the last time we really started very much at the beginning with the key ingredient of machine learning, understanding the basics that there's always this kind of three different elements that you really need. And the first one is really you believe there's a certain pattern. If there's no pattern, there's nothing to look for for machine learning. It learns from data, it learns to try to identify such a pattern. If you know it's a random number generator, it makes no really sense to learn it. The second in part is also what you would check is, is there any mathematical formula? We will learn this in the weather forecast, right? There are certain physical formulas already that stand the test of times, numerical methods. You just go ahead and implement them. You don't want to reinvent the wheel to really find those again. So if a mathematical formula of your problem already exists, it's more precise than searching for it. You just go ahead and implement it. And the third basically key ingredient in machine learning is really that data needs to be existing. If you don't have any data, then you cannot apply machine learning or deep learning algorithms. And we had some interesting example the last time in lecture 10, when we talked about this iris flower classification that also motivates why such automatic, um, let's say, algorithms are needed that perform this classification. Because here you see already, as a normal human, you are a little bit in doubt what is now this type of iris there, the new iris on the top right, is it iris Veronica, is it iris Vitosica? So what is the identity? It's hard to see from the images, right? So there are certain um, interesting features in the data we learned, which would be also an important term today when Gabriel will talk essentially about deep learning algorithms with feature um, automatically detected instead of essentially here um, identified by us in the last time where we had the basically petal width, right, as one of the ideas of a feature. And with this, you can really have sophisticated algorithms, but we started with one of the most first algorithms there. And this was really modeled after the human brain, a so-called neuron that is actually looked at. And this neuron is, of course, simplified in a way so that we call it a simple perceptron. And then when you come to a learning model, where we talked about there's always this model, which is a perceptual learning model, and an algorithm, which is a perceptual learning algorithm that goes alongside it. So here you see, basically, you have a couple of input nodes that are actually then 
uh, summed up by basically multiplying it by certain weights. And this weights is exactly the idea of what you will learn. You have, of course, here the situation that your inputs are constant, right? And the output Y in the supervised setup is also constant. This is given to you as a machine learner, but what you really want to know is what is the model that gave rise to it? And that's why basically these models will justify these red elements that you have there. So the weights and every new assignment of these weights will be another model, right? That's why on the right-hand side, you see the different lines because when you translate this a little bit to the right-hand side where you will see that essentially this linear learning model is nothing else than drawing a so-called decision boundary between these different, let's say, identities here of green and blue. And in order to do so, you play around with the weights and then maybe do a sign function to really understand minus one or plus one. Then towards basically the other part of the lecture, we learned there are more and more models. We looked a little bit more into the logistic regression model, um, a binary classification model as well with a logistic function, but also interestingly in tools that is supporting machine learning and which has at the back end a really strong HPC machine, like we have seen in the JSC, or basically what you have also in the Google call up, there are GPUs you can actually pick at. So this is an interesting tool for machine learning as well, and the modus operandi today. I think that's all I really wanted to leave you on the table for the review of the last lecture, and I think now it is uh, my um, opportunity to really have here an invited speaker, Gabriel, talking about deep learning. He is applying this daily as really an expert in this field. So thank you very much, Gabriel, and the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Maurice. And I think you already covered a lot of uh, previous work and the previous lectures. So I will start directly. So here you see the outline. You see that we have a lot of uh, content to cover. So let's start. Um, I will also do a little, you know, um, uh, covering of the what has been taught by Professor Morris. So, as you see, machine learning, right, is, is a branch of artificial intelligence uh, based on the idea that system can learn from the data, right? So, you want to identify patterns, make decisions uh, with basically minimum uh, minimum human intervention. So, it is an approach that automates, right, the building of uh, an analytical model. Um, you, you teach a computer system how to make uh, accurate uh, predictions, basically. So the, the key difference from traditional computer software is that at the end, the human developer hasn't written the code that instructs the system how to tell the difference between these uh, different classes that would be the flowers. So for example, in this case, you have you know, the iris cetosa and the iris virginica. So in this case, machine learning model has been taught how to discriminate between these flowers by being trained on a large amount of flower examples. So you have a data set, training set that you can use. <clears throat> um, so as Maurice already mentioned, um, the goal of machine learning is like to learn patterns from examples. And then of course, what you're aiming for is uh, generalization, which means that once your model is trained, then you will be able to uh, identify and recognize uh, future images and understand which sort of two flowers it is. And as a prerequisite, we already saw that you know, we need to have some pattern in the data uh, where we don't have an exact mathematical formula to, to uh, connect input and output. And of course, data uh, needs to exist, right? All right, so the perception, as more as we mentioned, is based on the analogy to the human nervous system. And it is inspired by the biological processes that occur uh, in the human brain. So the idea behind perception is that it is possible to mimic certain parts of neurons, right? Such as uh, the so-called dendrites, cell bodies, axons, using simplified mathematical models. So I will not enter into details here, but what is important to know is that um, the perceptron is an algorithm for supervised learning and for binary classification problems. <clears throat> so the binary classifier is basically a function which decide whether or not an input uh, belongs to a particular class. So this could be a flower or could be anything you like. Um, so here we know that the inputs are represented by a vector of numbers. And what are these numbers? These are the features, right? And you see here, for instance, the vector of feature at the input named by x1, x2, and xd. <clears throat> and the perception, as I mentioned, is a, a linear classifier 
because it uses a line to determine uh, the class of a given input. So you see here, we make a line. So, uh, and once we, grab, we basically draw a line uh, on a plot, we can call this as a decision boundary, right? So here is an example where we put first a decision boundary in a given place, right? And this is associated with particular parameters, the weights, and then we will move it in a better place by optimizing the weights, right? And uh, hopefully this would be a better place where uh, you could, uh, you know, basically uh, not do any error in the classification. So you see that uh, well, class blue dots and class green dots are well uh, separated. And this also could be true for the flowers. So any any classification, any binary classification problem that that you can uh, that you could imagine. Okay, so but the perceptron algorithm does not converge if the learning set is not linear separable. And uh, so, so if you have a problem that is not linear separable, the, the, the learning with the perceptron will never reach a point uh, where all examples are um, properly classified. And here you see an example with the uh, with XR or ex exclusive OR. Um, so just to, you know, to recap the problem, XR as function is basically should return a true value if the two inputs are, um, are not equal. So you see if you have zero, one, they will give you one. And if it's one, zero, it will give you one here. But if the inputs are the same, then it will give you a four, so a zero. So this is the problem you want to solve. And, uh, and of course, what you should learn here is that the perception cannot implement this. And the reason is, due to that, what we mentioned already, so that the, the, the perceptron is only capable of separating data points with a single line, right? So here you see here in this plot that this is not possible um, with, the, with a single line. So you need more than a single line and a decision boundary in order to be able to separate the, uh, the different classes. So the question here is, how do we actually solve these kind of problems, right? So this is what we would like to learn. So for this, we should now enter into the multi-layer perceptron. Um, and the idea here is to, to basically expand like beyond a two-layer architecture by adding an additional layer of units. And we say that these units don't have direct access to the outside world. And we call this a hidden layer. So this is something hidden in the middle, um, which when it's added, it can help or it can basically make your model able to solve this kind of problem. So basically a multi-layer perceptron uh, can have an, any number of units um, in its input, hidden and, and the uh, output layer. So you can have any, any number that you want. And um, we will see actually later an example. So the architecture basically is more complex, right, than the perceptron model. You see actually the, how the perceptron model will fit into now this new, uh, this new architecture, right? So it's just one of the, the, the neuron here. And, but of course, you know, it's more complex, but it's obviously is capable to, to achieve better uh, separations, you know, linear separations. So basically, if you are able to identify this, the, the right amount, the set of weights, your parameters, and then basically you will be able to make a proper separation in your uh, nonlinear problem. So to summarize uh, what we can say, so a two-layer natural classifier, as you see at the beginning, can only implement the linear decision boundary. And here you see again an example, while uh, with a sufficient number of hidden units, Right, the network can implement an arbitrary can implement arbitrary decision boundaries, and this can be very complex. And you can see here, for instance, another example. <clears throat> All right, so here you can see a general uh, architecture view of a multi-layer perceptron. So here you see you have a forward interconnection of several layers of perceptrons, right? So you see many connections here, and by interconnecting uh, the neurons we aim at increasing the capability of modeling basically complex input output relationship, right? So that's why we want to do this. And here is important to, to know that 
a multi-layer perceptron um, can be used as a universal approximation. And so what does it mean? So if we, if we now cite the, the universal approximation theorem, um, this claims that basically standard multi-layer feed forward networks with a single hidden layer, so only one hidden layer, with a finite number of neurons, of which we don't know, is actually able to approximate um, any continuous functions um, directly. So um, this is a very important property that you, uh, that you can uh, basically re rely on. Um, of course, you should consider obviously that um, the ability uh, to make these approximations, of course, is uh, constrained right, by of course, the number of neurons, the number of hidden layers, and many other techniques that you can utilize uh, during the training process and optimization. So this is not so simple. It's just you know, in theory possible. Of course, you have to also apply many different techniques and knowledge in order to, to get an actor that is able to achieve uh, this separation. <clears throat> so this is something to, to know. And here you see again uh, the architecture. So um, this is what we have here, right? Now, uh, I think we should now talk about um, activation functions. And uh, this is a very important uh, parameters of uh, the network that you will always have to basically decide uh, whenever you implement a neural network. So an activation function decides basically whether a neuron should be activated or not by calculating weighted sum of uh, that, you know, that you can have there. And of course, you have also the bias. Uh, the bias parameter. So the purpose of the activation function is to introduce nonlinearity non into the output of the neuron. So you do that. And so the question is why uh, we need nonlinear activation function, right? Because at the end, if you think about it, if you have a neural network without activation function, this will be just the general uh, linear regression model. And you don't want that. Right? Because at the end, what you want to do is to solve very complex problems, like, like you can see here in the plot. Like, so you see that a line here wouldn't work, as you see in the center part. But what you need is something more complex. <clears throat> and uh, so this is important to, to know. And of course, um, there are many activation functions available, right? So what, what we can see is that what the activation function does is to take a single number and performs a certain fixed mathematical operation. Here you see some examples. There are many types. Um, but of course, at the end, uh, you, when you start to work with this, uh, with this natural, with machine learning and deep learning, you really realize that the, uh, the, the, the ones that are actually used in practice, there are not so many, right? <clears throat> so at the end, there is not a let's say, a fixed rule for choosing, uh, you know, uh, what is the activation function that you want to have in your hidden layers. Um, of course, there are many considerations that, you know, one should make when deciding uh, which activation function to use, like, you know, for instance, how difficult it is to compute the derivative, if it's actually differentiable at all, or, you know, how quickly neural network will converge with this activation function itself. So there are many, many reasons behind. Um, but at the end, you can always rely on previous works and see what other people use. And here for other people, I mean, you know, your community, your research uh, colleagues that maybe already work on the application domain and use similar data with similar neural architecture. So there is already an experience behind. You, say you can already rely on this experience um, without making any you know, random decision. But yeah, the only things to remember basically is that the choice of the activation function for the hidden layers it will control um, how well the natural model will learn from the training data sets. So this is very important. And uh, the choice that you do for the activation function in the output layer, this will define the type of classification, and the type of, sorry, prediction that the model can do. Okay. Now, um, here I would like to remark one aspect that uh, in order to avoid any, you know, any possible yeah, only possible confusions, right? So mm, a perceptron um, cannot perform nonlinear classification, regardless if the choice of the activation function. So if you have a perceptron and you get and you use a nonlinear activation function, it doesn't mean that you will be able to solve the XR problem. 
So what you have here is the following. So the input is projected onto the weight vector and shifted along a direction. And this is a linear operation that reduces the input to a single value at the end, right? So, um, which is again passed through this linear, um, this nonlinear activation function. So here you see an example, for instance, on the right side, where you have a perceptron with a logistic sigma, which is an activation function. And uh, what you can see here is that uh, the function here is a surface. So you have a surface bent into a sigmoidal shape um, along the direction of the weight vector that you have. And uh, by changing the weights, you can rotate the direction, right, of the surface and stretch it or shift it. But uh, basically, the fundamental sigmoid shape will always remain, right? So you always have this shape, which means that, again, you will not be able to perform uh, nonlinear classification. So this is something that um, you should remember. All right, so in order to, to give a little example, I would like to show you a demonstration where which is, um, I will show you through um, a TensorFlow Deep Playground, which is an interactive visualization of neural networks. And, um, and here you have a lot, the control of many parameters. So let me go through that. So here you, have, you can see that you have many different parameters and some of them you don't know yet, um, but don't worry here. We, will just, we want just to show basically uh, what I just explained, right? So uh, at this stage, what you know, are the, you have the layers, right? You have the neurons, the activation functions. So we can start by considering uh, a problem. So you can see here, you can decide the problem and you can see it here is a non-linear classification problem. And uh, we start by using the perception architecture. And uh, so we're already ready to start. So we can already play. And now is, we are training the perception. And as you can see, um, the decision boundary is down here. And, and you can see that we are not able basically to, yeah, to make a discrimination right between the, the two classes. So this is confirmed what I was saying before, right? With the perception, and you can, of course, try different type of activation and parameter. You will still not be able to, to solve this problem. So what you can do, as we, we explain in the theory, we can basically add a, a hidden layer in the middle. And we can start by considering one uh, neuron. And we can start uh, basically training it. And as you can see, um, we have, things are you know, better than before, but still we are on a linear uh, decision boundary. So it means that one uh, one neuron is not enough. So the theorem that I was referring before, it didn't tell you uh, that you can solve this with one new neuron in the hidden layer. You need a lim an amount of neurons. We don't know yet, so we will have to try. So we can now basically try to add second neurons. And you can see that now the decision boundary is getting a bit more complicated, right? So you can see that you have this different shape, which is not this line anymore, uh, but this is still not enough. So we would basically need to add probably another one. And yes, as you can see now, uh, with uh, one hidden layer, three uh, neurons inside, you can now define a proper uh, complex decision boundary that is able to solve this problem. So uh, this is just an example I wanted to show here, but you know, feel free to try it out also with different parameters. And maybe also some of the things that you find here, they will be more clear also after the, my lecture of today and the next lecture, right? But I think this is a very nice tool also for visualization and it can make ideas a bit more clear. Okay. So let's now enter slowly in the domain of uh, yeah, deep learning. I will try to do it as smooth as possible. So, Mm, so what we try to, to so what we try to, to do here is you know at the beginning with the flowers was to um, was to model uh, the class membership of the flowers that was conditioned by the features of the flowers right so if you remember in the data set you had basically uh, four features or attributes for each of the image uh, or each of the sample that you have right so you had this uh, the, the length and the width of the sepal and the length and the width of the petal. So these are features that are used um, basically to uh, discriminate uh, later on the classes. And 
So you have basically the features and of course also the, the label, right? So for each image, you have uh, a text saying, yeah, this is either Iris Setoza or Iris Virginia, right? So based on the combination of these four features, you could develop a machine learning model that could distinguish uh, these different classes. And basically here you can already, you know, understand that the, the importance of the selection of the right features, because at the end, if these features were completely different and meaningless, um, of course, your model will not probably work uh, very good. And this is what basically I want to try to, to discuss here. So if we now consider a general, general processing pipeline that you, that you would use uh, for uh, yeah, for basically establishing a classification classifier. Uh, here you see three three main uh, three main steps. So in the first step you have the so-called pre-processing. <laughs> so pre-processing uh, is very important actually because uh, most of the time the range of values of the values of the features can vary a lot. Um, so you can have actually different scales uh, or even outliers errors, right? So um, and the classification algorithm cannot work properly if the range of all the feature is not rescaled and properly formatted. So mm, you always need to do some pre-processing before you start to, do, uh, to apply your, your classifier. And some of the popular methods are, you will probably see mean subtraction, where basically you, some, uh, you subtract the mean of each of the features or normalization, for instance, where you know, the data dimension um, is approximated to a particular scale. So this is very important, many techniques, also a lot of to know. Um, now, if we now go to the, to, the, to the step for feature extraction and selection, um, as you already saw, this is a very crucial step, right? And the choice of the features basically uh, depends on the, on, on the classification problem you are working on. But, you know, as a general rule, you should consider that Features I mean, should be able to be extracted if you do it manually at least. Um, they should be um, insensitive to possible noise and outliers, right? And, and of course, very important, they should you know, um, be able to discriminate the patterns of the different classes, right? So this is very important because at the end, if you don't have discriminative features, um, this is just completely irrelevant then for your problem. Right, then you have the final uh, classification step, uh, which basically, uh, yeah, it's basically based on the feature that you extracted in order to make, the, um, to make the decision. So here you can already see um, a key difference uh, between, uh, yeah, between machine learning and deep learning. And this basically uh, is placed exactly in this, in this concept, in this step of about the features. <clears throat> so if we now look more into details about this, so what you can see is that you have um, two possibilities, right? So basically um, you have either the step where you first, uh, yeah, you define the features, right? And this process is called also usually, yeah, feature engineering. Um, where basically you work on the features, you are an expert of your data set, so you, you know, uh, based on the experience, uh, what are the features that actually can be useful for the classification. So here you have two separate steps. And in this case, the classifier at the end is, doesn't need to be uh, complex, right? But that's why we call it shallow, uh, shallow learner, because you already did most of the job before. You prepare the data in a way that then now they're easy to, to be uh, discriminated. Um, while deep learning is try to exploit basically uh, the unknown structure that you find in the input distribution of the data in order to discover better representation. And it does that in multiple levels, this is very important. So it basically learns feature hierarchies, hierarchies um, with feature from higher levels, formed by the composition of lower level features. This is also, you can see an example here where you start from you know, a low level feature, mid level feature and high level feature. And this is all interconnected. So the, the automation of learning features 
um, yeah, at multiple levels, so abstraction allows the system basically to learn complex functions. And complex functions are these decision boundaries that I was mentioning before, right? So you can really build very, very complex decision boundaries, which means that you can really solve complex problems. Um, and the, the, yeah, the, the benefit of deep learning or the advantage of deep learning is that you can do this um, automatically, directly from the data. Uh, without basically be dependent of human crafted features. So this is, uh, if you want, uh, the very first, let's say, level where you can really make a discrimination between a classical you know, machine learning approach and the deep learning approach. So this is something that is very important. <clears throat> All right, so now, of course, you might be wondering um, the following question. So how deep a machine learning model like for instance, a uh, neural network needs to be, right, to be considered a deep learning model. So at the end, we started, you know, we had a perception at the beginning, then we started to, to add a hidden layer, and then we could add so more hidden layers, one, two, three. Um, so the question, of course, comes uh, from scale, right? Mm -hmm. um, however, this is not a proper question to make, and the, the reason is that um, you know, we, it's not that we call deep models as deep learning. It is that, you know, in order to achieve hierarchical learning, the models need to be deep, right? So if you remember, I show you this hierarchy and this, you know, um, learning of these hierarchical features uh, in different levels. So how we can identify whether a model, uh, you know, is a deep learning model or not. So while well, simply by so simply by verifying that if the model uses hierarchical feature learning, um, then it's a deep learning model. So if you identify lower low level feature first, and then you build upon them, try right, to identify higher level features by using convolutional filters, for instance, then you get, then you can really say that you're doing deep learning, right? So if not, um, then actually it doesn't really matter, you know, if you use, uh, you know, uh, 1,000 fully connected layers, right? It doesn't really matter because at the end you're not doing this process of learning the features uh, automatically. So this is something that you know you should consider if you get you know if you get this question in mind. Okay, so let's now come back to the over to an overview of an architecture, and this is the so-called fully connected neural network, right? And Basically, here you see, you, you, we start, you know, again, we started from the beginning with the perception and we had a hidden layer, but of course you can have many as you, many as you want. And this is, you will see us call it as fully connected neural network. And here is important to notice that each neuron, you can see here is fully connected, all the neurons in the previous layer. So you see that here, and that and the neurons in a single layer function uh, do not share any connection. Okay, so this is what you see here. Now the question is, okay, so if we deal with images, right, because we started with this example with the flowers. So the question is, how can we use spatial structure in the inputs to inform the architecture of the network, right? So um, if you see here, the fully connected neural network doesn't really scale well with the, with the image, right? Because at the end, you know, you need to take it to, uh, to the input image, right, and transform it into a vector of pixel values. And this is what you would do here. And you can already see that first, you are now losing the spatial information because you're just you know, you know, basically passing from a 2D to a 1D vector. And then of course, you can also have the factor that you know, when you add several neurons, the parameters grow quickly, right? And this of course would happen with very large images. Because of course, at the end, you need to connect right, all the neuron uh, in the hidden layer to the neurons of the input layer. So we can basically say intuitively that you know, fully, uh, yeah, fully connectivity is, is wasteful. And, you know, and the huge number of parameters can lead also to other problems, which you don't know yet, but it's the so-called overfitting, which is a term basically that defines uh, if an actor, if a model is good, and then it's generalizing uh, with new samples. So, for example, with the you know, once you train your model with the with the flowers, then I come with a new image uh, of a different flower. I mean, on the same class or one of the two classes, 
but uh, the network will not be able to really understand which of the two classes is because it's not able to generalize. And it means that the model has been overfit. Um, but yeah, this is a bit more, let's say, advanced concept. But basically what I'm trying to say is that um, this kind of architecture might not be uh, the best one, especially when we want to try to deal with images. So here you see again, let, let's start again from example. So we have a digital image. It's basically two degree of pixels, right? And uh, we can basically find it as a matrix. And uh, a neural network basically, you saw it expects a vector of numbers as an input, right? So you have the input layer. And what you need to do is basically vectorizing it. And this is what you, you would do. And, uh, but before that I continue, I should first mention two properties that you might expect when you deal with images, right? So we talk about, uh, yeah, locality. Um, and we, here we mean that, you know, the structure in, an images, are, in images are local. Uh, for example, here you can see, you know, uh, yes, fake image that represents a, a roof of the house. And what you can see here is that if you pick a pixel in the middle of the roof, you can expect that you know, the neighbor pixels uh, also will belong to the, to the roof. So you see you have a locality. Um, and this kind of brings you to the idea is that uh, the operation that you then you might apply to the image should be based then on patches, so on, on local portion of the image, not, not overall the image that you get. At the end. So it means that basically it should probably would be better to work locally. And then you can also consider the translation invariance property, which means that you know, meaningful patterns can occur anywhere in the image. Right? So like this bird it can be on the top part, in the center, on the bottom part, it doesn't really matter. It is the same object, it's important, it's the same. Um, so which means that if we do an operation, if we analyze the image, um, we should probably do the same kind of operation all over the image, right? Because at the end, we can expect to, to meet uh, the important the, the object that you were you know, that are looking for um, in any position of the image. So you don't want to change the way how you, uh, like how you operate uh, in different locations of the image, but you want to do the same. <clears throat> and this is the so-called translation bias. Okay, so we said that basically um, a fully connected neural network uh, yeah, doesn't scale very well with images, right? Which means that we, um, we are looking for a different architecture that make uh, explicit assumption that the images, yeah, that the inputs are images basically, <clears throat> right? So we want to have an actor that, you know, this is our actor here in the middle, but you know, we want to have a starting point where we know the input are images. And at the end, of course, we still want to detect uh, different type of classes, right? So either flowers or anything. So we said that objects, right, tend to have a local special support, like you see here, for instance, the petal or the flower or the, you know, over the, the roof of the house. And of course, you can define it very well, right, with the, with the, with the lattice or with the grid. Um, so the question is how to define basically an architecture that can exploit this property. <clears throat> so how we can incorporate basically this locality assumption. So what we do, you can see here, we are basically now passing from a fully connected unit to a locally connected. So at the end, you see now the neurons will be not connected anymore to all the pixels inside the image, but now you will have a connection on a local, on a local part of the image, right? So this is the first property that you want to see. Now, of course, you want also to remember how to, um, to incorporate the other property, um, which means that, you know, at the end, the operation that you will do here locally on this, on this part of the image, you would do it the same in another location. So it means that the weights are shared, are the same, right? So this is what, uh, what you would like to use. So you see, we pass from a, an architecture that is fully connected to a completely different architecture, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so in order to arrive to a good point where we can define the architecture, now let's give a short review to the convolution. So here we have a problem, right? So imagine that we want to uh, make a classification. So we want to classify an X uh, from a set of binary images. And um, so for a classification, we can see that it's not really possible to compare two matrices 
and check if these are equal because of course you know you can have different effects you know maybe you might you know have an x that is you know rotated the format so you cannot really do a fair let's say a direct comparison of the full on the full image so an effective approach is basically to compare the image piece by piece so which means that you work locally and basically you try to identify uh, meaningful features uh, this could be small you know in this case you see you know four pixels or three times three pixel it depends you will have to decide that but you, you work locally <clears throat> and um, so basically what what means that you know if you're able to identify the the, the right uh, you know the right parameters here on your filter then whenever you will go over the particular feature that define an x as an x basically then you will be able to get the match so at the end you see here that you know whenever you will be able in this case you know, this is the feature the, the filter and you can see here that you know once it goes over this particular part you get a perfect match and the perfect match means that you have an activation which means that okay i recognize that there is a there is a particular feature that you know it can tell me that you know i'm sure that this is an x so it helps you right so it, this is something that uh, very helpful for the classification but of course you need to identify what are the right uh, parameters here to make to, to be able to get this activation <clears throat> so here you should be able you know to to see so you see the convolution here we start from a part and then you have the filter and you go through all the images and you get in output the so-called feature map, which is basically a reflect where the input was activated by the flag feature and these weights inside the red one are the one that you have to learn right so these are we're still talking about weights and doesn't matter you know which the weights were from the beginning you know when we were talking about perceptron at the end you see that you just need to learn the weights <clears throat> And you can see that you know once you learn the particular set of weights, you are able to uh, identify particular, uh, for instance, you know, uh, property of the image. You see some edges, stomach fat, etc. Okay, so basically, what you can expect in the convolutional layer is the following. So you have a, so you have your input data. Imagine you have an RGB image. And what you do is to basically define, in this case, for instance, two filters. So one filter is basically this kernel here, which go through over the image. And whenever it passes, uh, it will create uh, an activation. So it will create a feature map um, value, which will then form you see an output here. So basically, the first filter will give you an, a feature map, the first feature map, and the second filter will give you a second feature map. <clears throat> right. So the output here um, is basically uh, another cube, but each layer is a feature map that was you know, determined by the filter that you that you are using. <laughs> right. So make it more clear. So if you have a convolutional layer, what you do is to basically convolve right multiple filters, kernels to obtain multiple feature maps. So at the end, you will get a certain number of feature. Maps. So, which means that you know the input and the images, like for the channels RGB, but you see that in remote sensing in our domain, we have actually more more channels, and the output is still a list of uh, features, or still a list of bands of images. So, of course, you can have different uh, type of convolution operation. Yeah, we'll go quick, quickly. But just to let you know that you know you might have a valid convolution where basically the output size um, is you can compute it so you know exactly what would be the, the dimension of the of the of the feature map so you see here uh, of course you can also add different you know we call padding where basically you can use it to um, to obtain um, a particular size in the output of the feature um, you can also, yeah, for instance, here you can see that, you know, we can obtain the output sites as the input site by adding, for instance, one particular padding here. And uh, so there are all tricks that you can use. Then, of course, you can also think about, you know, uh, striding the convolution uh, with the step that is uh, more than one. So you can decide that. Of course, this is mostly based uh, on the, you know, the property of the image, the resolution. You can also think about different types of convolution operation where you have 
A dilated convolution, for instance, here, where you don't consider just a little particular local part, but you consider more distributed, in a way, you know, neurons. Um, but then, of course, you can also have other stuff, but you can also do the convolution deep. So you can see that basically you have many different ways to, to perform this. And, and this is basically uh, uh, all the domain, especially you will realize it if you start working with this, uh, with this data. Okay, so I will basically stop with this slide and just, you know, summarize that what you can expect in a convolutional neural network are three main components. So you will have the first component, which are the convolutional layer, where you exactly apply these filters on the image by, you know, taking into account the properties I was saying, the locality, the variance, and you can use that to generate feature maps. Uh, but then uh, you can also have other type of uh, layers that are the core, for instance, pooling layer where you, you just basically down sampling. You don't, you don't do much. You just basically reduce the dimension. Um, and this can help, can be helpful also to, you know, to reduce the amount of parameters. And then at the end, you still have a fully connected layers where you will basically make the decision of the type of class that you want to, that you want to detect. So, Basically, in this lecture, we started from a perceptron. We arrived, we arrived to this multilayer perceptron, and then we move to a new architecture that is more basically designed for, for dealing with images and their properties, right? Okay, so I will stop here. All right, yeah, thank you very much, Gabriel. That was very insightful, and we will continue with the second part of the lecture in a couple of minutes.